Welcome to Web Accessibility Through the Ages. I'm Milena. Um, I was a senior front-end developer at Lullabot. I've since turned technical account manager. I turned to the dark side and now I'm in sales. Um, I, <laughs> I specialize in making the web awesome for everyone. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, this little guy, uh, his pronouns are he, him, as far as we currently know. Um, and in case you aren't familiar with our work, we do have a new logo. Ooh, ah. Um, we're a development, strategy, and design agency, and we build delightful digital experiences for large-scale content publishers using Drupal. All right, so before we start, I wanna give you a quick idea of what you're in for for this talk. Um, if you think an accessibility talk sounds kind of boring, or if you're not sure what accessibility might entail, you're probably someone who really needs to be here, so I'm glad that you are. Um, for the folks who might not be super acquainted with accessibility, I'm going to give like the briefest accessibility 101 like ever. Then we're going to take a peek into the history of accessibility, have a look at what's happening in accessibility now, and then we're going to look at some of the cool stuff in the horizon um, for a little bit of a sneak peek of the future. So let's start at the start, and that's what is accessibility. At the heart of it, web accessibility is pretty simple. Basically, web accessibility is like the wheelchair ramp at a store for your website. Now, I barely make it the door. Okay. Oh, that's better. So when we talk about web accessibility, most people immediately think of visual impairments, people with motor impairments, and kind of tend to stop there. But there are a lot of different people that accessibility benefits. So yes, we do have people with visual impairments, and those users might have trouble distinguishing between colors if they're colorblind, um, viewing content without enough contrast if they're low vision, or they might not be able to see at all. Then you have your motor impaired users, and motor impaired users may have trouble with their dexterity or their movement. So that might be someone who had a stroke, that might be someone who's paralyzed from the neck down, that could be someone with Parkinson's who has like a tremor, that involves a lot of different things. Um, so they might not have fine motor skills. They might not even have gross motor skills. They might use a mouse stick. People with vestibular issues are one that people don't realize is an issue a lot of the time, but they can feel sick from content with like special effects that trigger motion sickness. So if you have like parallax or like things that wave around, like you can make someone nauseous from your site and MacBooks are expensive, so it's good to not have people throw up in their MacBook. Um, <laughs> then we have our deaf and hard of hearing users, and those users may have trouble understanding audio content if there's not an appropriate transcript or captioning. So we want to make sure we don't leave our deaf users out. Um, another really important one that a lot of people don't know about are seizure disorders. Um, users who are prone to seizures can be triggered into an attack by flashing effects or um, you know color schemes that shift quickly and. People can get really hurt from seizures, so we really don't want to harm anyone with our website. Uh, and then we have people with cognitive differences. So users with cognitive differences may or may not have a physical disability, but they may need more time to ingest the material. Um, they may benefit from you not using a $10 word when you could use a $1 word. Uh, they might benefit from like not having a slider that slides things away from them while they're still reading. And of course, everybody else. Um, by making your site more accessible for people with disabilities, you also make it more useful for everyone else because you're lowering the barrier to entry to that information. So a lot of the time when I get pushback about accessibility with clients, uh, one of the biggest things that people say is, well, accessibility is kind of an edge case issue. Like, do we need to invest in this because it's only a small portion of our users or it's only you know, a couple people that this is gonna impact? But <laughs> there are 18 and a half million more dis severely disabled people in the United States than there are people living in the entire state of New York. So if I went back to my client and I was like, hey, guess what? Site's ready to launch. It's looking great. We've tested it. It works in IE. You know, it's working. It's perfect. Um, it won't work in New York though. Is that fine? Is that a problem? Yeah. <laughs> they would never let you launch that. Um, so that's definitely something to take into consider is how many people that does impact. Um, another way to think about it is that there are more than twice as many people with disabilities in the United States as the entire population of Australia. 
Uh, we're looking at 56.7 million people with a disability. So it's, it's a pretty large amount of people and that's an important myth to dispel. Um, especially with people online getting older, we're seeing this shift of a large population of people who become disabled with age. Mm -hmm. There are people who are living in the modern age and they rely on that access to maintain their independence. Like grandma needs to be able to pay her light bill and they don't take checks anymore. Um, <laughs> and you know, their social lives, grandma wants to be on Facebook and to enjoy a lot of the recreational options that the digital world provides. If you haven't seen Skyrim Granny, by all means, YouTube her, she is a delight. So the first place I'd like to dive in is at the beginning, and that's the history of web accessibility. And I think it's important to see how far we've come. In case you didn't know, in 1995, Dr. Cynthia Waddell published a web accessibility standard for the city of San Jose's Office of Equality Assurance. And this was the first web accessibility standard ever written down. Her work was years ahead of its time. The web, um, the web content accessibility guidelines that we had, that we all refer to today, wouldn't be published for nearly half a decade still. Uh, she was born with a profound hearing loss. And her parents were told by doctors that she would never speak. And she defied all predictions. She became a lawyer, a public activist, and the accessibility technology expert for the UN. Uh, she slated at pretty much every level. Um, unfortunately, she did pass away a few years ago, but she, she's a legend. <laughs> Look her up, she's amazing. Um, and here are the standards that she came up with. I'm not gonna read this whole list here. Um, I will post these slides online, Drupal Camp does that. Um, so if you do wanna check it out at your leisure later, they will be there. But rather, I put this up to illustrate that the first accessibility standards were pretty small. They were able to fit on just a single slide, provided that I used itty bitty text. Um, <laughs> but they were standards that endured. Alternative text, form accessibility, alternate access, good tables and practices, um, video and audio transcripts, descriptions, that's all listed here. So her first attempt at ever codifying these standards created this lasting structure around the accessibility requirements that we enjoy today. Sorry, I just need a little sip. So that brings us to 1999. In 1999, the W3C published their first version of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. It included 14 guidelines, and it covered a lot of the same requirements as the ones listed by Dr. Waddell. Then in 2008, we got WCAG 2.0, and it was kind of a big deal because it was the first time we ever looked at the underlying principles as guidelines. We started exploring quality standards, not just as rules and checklists, but with the goal of people understanding the reasons for those rules. So technology kind of boomed in the aughts, so WCAG evolved to keep up. WCAG 1.0 was a really good first try for the time period in which it existed. But 2.0 brought us up to where technology was at the new current time. So it was no longer limited to just websites. It applied to almost everything digital. So it was things like documents and applications. And we got poor. So let's take a closer look at the poor principles that we had 2.0 put into effect. The first was perceivable. Users should be able to perceive your content, despite possibly needing to access the information in an alternative way. So your content exists over there on the screen. Content needs to get into their brain. And it shouldn't be limited to only one sense for it to be able to get there. The next part was operable. Users should be able to operate your website using a variety of methods and forms of technology. So I shouldn't need to use a keyboard to be able to get to your, sorry. I shouldn't be able to need to use a mouse to get to everything in your website because if I'm blind, I can't see with the cursor on the screen to know where I'm clicking. If I am paralyzed from the neck down, I'm not going to be able to use a mouse or a keyboard. Mm -hmm. I have a mouth stylus. And so even if something is technically, I can get there by hitting the tab key 650 times. Gosh, please don't make me do that. Give me a skip link <laughs> because that's a lot of my day to just click through that. The next portion is understandable. Your content should be understandable. Be clear, concise, and allow users to explore content at their own pace and robust. Your website should be robust enough to stand up to reasonably outdated, current, and anticipated tech standards and the assistive technology that goes with them. This was a really big deal about five to 10 years ago 
because at the time there were very few open source options for screen readers. Mm -hmm. And so if the browser, if they wanted to upgrade their browser, they had to upgrade their screen reader. Well, that could cost thousands of dollars. And a lot of people couldn't afford to do that. Having a disability is unfortunately expensive. And so a lot of people with disabilities were left on like IE6, IE7, couldn't afford to upgrade. And then these websites would not be accessible to them because their screen reader wasn't compatible with it. Mm -hmm. These days there are a lot more open source options, fewer people profiteering off people with disabilities, but it's still really important to keep that in mind. Sorry. <laughs> You're good. I needed this break anyway. <laughs> so let's talk about web accessibility today. <coughs> Excuse me. The next iteration of the WCAG was our current iteration. And that brings us to web accessibility of today. WCAG 2.1 is awesome in a lot of ways. It doesn't deprecate WCAG 2.0, but it adds new specs to improve accessibility to keep up with our current technology and the way it's used. 17 new success criteria were added to address mobile accessibility, people with low vision, people with cognitive and learning disabilities. And most people on the web are using something other than a standard PC and laptop including people with disabilities. In some cases of disability, a, smart, a smartphone or a tablet might be the best device to use to reach the internet. Um, so it's important that we're accounting for the people with those needs. Users with low vision have needs that differ from blind users. <laughs> so increasing visual access for people with low vision adds access for a lot of people. And then finally, cognitive and learning disabilities are now accounted for. As our population ages, we have more people with dementia dependent on the internet, as well as the importance of including people with intellectual disabilities and learning disabilities. Making the web usable for everyone is a priority in the modern era, and providing for this allows people to remain independent as possible. So when we talk about cognitive disabilities, one of the things that I found in my interviews with people with dementia is they said it was very helpful for them if the navigation portions of the site remain the same from page to page. Mm -hmm. Because if they went to a different page and the navigation changed, they got lost. They had to learn the site all over again. It was very confusing and disjointing. So keeping that the same from page to page is really helpful. Disclaimer, I'm not gonna stand here and read all 17 of the new guidelines for you because that would account for most all of our allotted time together. And I do wanna cover other things. However, I do think it's worthwhile to hit a highlight reel of these new standards just to get a sense for the type of changes that were made and for what purpose. Okay, for instance, guideline 1.3, adaptable, seeks to make information flexible so that people with diverse bodies and cognitive abilities are each able to access it in the way that works best for them. They created AA standards to provide for people to be able to access content at a variety of orientations, which is something we should be taking into account with our mobile designs. So for example, if I'm in a wheelchair and my tablet is mounted to my chair so I can use it, with that mount, I may not be able to pivot my tablet. Like if I have SMA and I can't move my arms like that, I can't just turn it vertical because I need it to be vertical. So having it work properly at responsive breakpoints, both at portrait and horizontal is really important. Yeah? What is SMA? I'm sorry. Oh, that's spinal muscular atrophy. It's a progressive uh, neurological disorder where you you kind of get like your muscles lock up over time and you lose motor function. Thank you. Yeah. So while we're in adaptable, um, another one we added was 1.3.5. And that's allowing users to autofill whenever possible on form elements. That allows people to decide how they would like to interact with the web. Either you can input it yourself, you can click to each field and fill it out, or you can allow your browser to do that repetitive typing for you. And this is one of those examples where this also benefits people who aren't differently abled. I think probably all of us use that browser autofill feature and you're like, yes, I don't have to fill in my address again. But that's super helpful for people who are using a mouth stylus or have dyslexia or have a timing issue because a lot of forms time out, even though that's also an accessibility standard. That's really helpful to a lot of people. Guideline 1.4, distinguishable, has some overlap with 1.3. Allowing users to access things in a way that works for them 
without making the assumption that something works for everyone is really key. For instance, allowing content to reflow to fit within breakpoints without forcing users to scroll back and forth off screen allows for a smoothing reading experience for everyone, but it's essential for people that becomes a barrier too. So I think this has happened to all of us with like a site that is like poorly responsive and you have to like, eh, read that, okay. Eh, that's like super obnoxious. But if you have a disability, that can be the difference between being able to use that site at all or not. Text contrast has long been a double A requirement. If you've worked in accessibility at all, you know that that's kind of a thing. And it's every designer's bane to have the developer come back and be like, can we make that gray like a little bit darker so it passes contrast testing? But like, that's for a reason. It really is important. Um, <laughs> so we had that for text, but what we didn't have it for was the other items on the page. <laughs> so you could read the text, but people need to be able to see the UI components like text box borders menu buttons, infographics, all of these different things that impart information also need to pass that contrast testing so that people can see what they're using on the page. Now, everything that's interactive or imparts data needs to be contrast compliant, not just text. So a lot of us use pinch and zoom intuitively. You get used to it. Um, <laughs> well, with 2.5.1, pointer gestures, like, I will admit with shame that I've reflexively attempted this on, like, paper books. Do you ever, like, <laughs> and you're like, right, this isn't my phone. Books don't do that. Um, <laughs> but what if you couldn't move your fingers that way? What if your dexterity didn't work that way? A new A standard, which is a pretty big deal, since A is considered the most basic standard of accessibility, requires that multi-point gestures like pinch and zoom also have a single point access. So, for instance, if you had a map that you want to zoom in on, there should also be a plus and minus button so that you can zoom without having to do this. And we got another A-level criteria, motion act actuation. A lot of apps now have motion-based functions. Like, you know how you go to Starbucks and like, instead of having to navigate the menu to pull up your gold card, you can just shake it and then you're like, here's my barcode, give me coffee. Um, <laughs> well, that is super cool. I love that feature, but not everyone is able to shake or rotate a phone. So instead of assuming that all bodies can access that function, we need to be considerate of physical diversity and give users an alternate way to access that functionality, like a button or a voice command. I you want coffee. Coffee. <laughs> okay, I didn't go over the exhaustive list of the WCAG 2.1 guidelines, but I really hope that you'll visit w3.org and read about them. It's not a terribly long read. And it's really interesting. Like, there's a lot of little nuggets in there where you're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense that, like, you wouldn't really think of. Um, so what else is happening in web accessibility these days? Lawsuits. Lots of them. Um, you'll notice that my specter of neglected accessibility here is smiling. <laughs> these lawsuits might stink for companies, but they're awesome for people with disabilities. A lot of large companies only care about accessibility once they get sued. And if a punch in the pocket is what it takes to get these organizations to do the right thing, that's what it takes. And I will celebrate victories for accessibility in any form they take. So, <laughs> before we go any further, I think it's relevant to point out that I am not an attorney. I think that's pretty obvious since I'm speaking at a tech conference on a Saturday afternoon, but just in case it wasn't super crystal clear, I sell websites. I am not an attorney. However, as an accessibility evangelist, I've been keeping a pretty close eye on what's been happening in the courts with web accessibility, and it doesn't look pretty for those who are deciding to forego the effort. By the official letter of the law, written as it is, public sector in the US is required to be AA compliant. That means any organization that is funded wholly or partially with federal state tax dollars must adhere to AA compliance levels under section 508. This includes federal agencies, local agencies, universities, and private organizations that receive any tax funding. So if your organization gets one dollar from the government, you have to be double A compliant. That's the law. Now before all of you in the private sector start breathing a big sigh of relief, I'd like to point out that the ADA has historically been a gray area for digital inclusion. And a lot of landmark cases that have been landing have been making that area a lot more black and white. Lots of household names in the private sector have all been sued for inaccessibility websites. 
And they've ended up paying out. Target paid six million to settle. Mm -hmm. Netflix lost their lawsuit from the NAB and paid out over $700,000 in damages. And they agreed to add closed captioning to all of their offerings, which I'm sure many of us enjoy today. So if you're using those captions on Netflix, you can thank the NAD because they made Netflix do that. So two years ago, a man brought suit against Winn-Dixie and won in the Florida courts. A Florida federal judge, Judge Robert Scola, issued in the plaintiff's favor, stating, although Winn-Dixie argues that Gill has not been denied access to Winn-Dixie's physical store locations as a result of the inaccessibility of the website, the ADA does not merely require physical access to a place of a public accommodation. Rather, the ADA requires that disabled individuals be provided full and equal enjoyment of the goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, or accommodations of any place of public accommodation. With each lawsuit, current law against websites that discriminate or deny service to people with disabilities gets a little stronger. And that means we're seeing a big push in the public sector, which is nice. So did I go over the lawsuits thing to scare you? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but I'm not just here to scare you. I'm also here to inspire you a little bit. So accessibility isn't like, cause you have to, at least hopefully not. Like I know sometimes we have to, but like <laughs> I would hope it's because you want to, because another human somewhere is going to use the cool stuff you've built. And you should be excited about including people instead of disappointing them or giving them a frustrating experience. So while we've got a little time left together, the final thing I want to leave you with were some updates on new accessibility technology. Well, we don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> it's pretty cool to see what people have been working on and where our more inclusive future might lead. So instead of looking at what companies have done wrong, let's have a look at what companies are doing right. Who's kind of nailing it with accessibility right now? Microsoft is. First up is there, I'm going to preface this, I'm a really big gamer, so <laughs> I think this stuff is super cool, but first up is their accessible Xbox adaptive controller for the Xbox One. It gives players with motor disabilities the ability to set up their controller the way they need it to be to work for them. So accessibility isn't always about like, I have to pay my bills online, or I have to access my bank statement, or my workplace. Those things are important, and people need to be able to do that. But it's also about being able to hang out with your friends, enjoy yourself using current technology, and Microsoft is making a really good showing about including people in those digital spaces, which have been neglected for some time. <coughs> They've also gone a little deeper and put more thought into it than a single product. They've created the co-pilot function so that a player can use two controllers at once as a single controller. That allows uh, people to enjoy full control and either one can be used however the user likes. So if you can't put your hands together to use one controller, mount two controllers. Use the buttons on this side, use the joystick on this side, whatever works for you. Um, or if this hand doesn't work, maybe you have a friend work part of the controls and you work what you can on your side. It's, you know, it's really adaptable that way. They also have custom button mapping that lets people remap the buttons on their controller to account for motor disabilities that might not allow them to reach certain buttons. Basically, if there's any configurable option that will let you play video games, <laughs> Microsoft is looking for it for you. So that's super cool. Another company doing really cool accessibility work is Google. If you're anything like me, you use a lot of voice activated stuff. Because my husband, shout out, hey -o, um, and I are both huge nerds, pretty much our entire house runs on the Google Home Hub. I can set the thermostat, turn off the fan, lock my front door, turn off the lights, turn on Netflix, just by shouting whims into the air. <laughs> and honestly, it's pretty amazing. It's like we're living in the future. And imagine the kind of liberty that a setup like that affords someone who has serious mobility issues, instead of someone like me who is just pregnant and on the couch and doesn't want to get up. Um, <laughs> so, unfortunately, voice activated stuff historically doesn't work super well if your voice has any kind of modulation issue or if you have a slur or um, real vocal difference off the standard deviation. That's where Project Euphonia comes in. With Project Euphonia, Google has started creating a catalog of the voices of people with various disabilities that might cause different speech patterns or lisps or vocal differences in an attempt to adapt their voice recognition system to a wider range of vocal diversity. So an essential part of 
being in any community is being understood. And Google is doing that in a broad new way by seeking to create technology that doesn't leave their voices out of the circle or out of their user base. And you! Okay, so call me a bright-eyed optimist, but I'd love to believe that another part of upcoming accessibility is each of us doing our own part. Knowing a little bit more about what the needs of our users are gives us a chance to make things more accessible for people. And I'm sure we'd all like to do that. I'm not gonna ask you to go back and fix your entire website to AAA compliance today. Although that would be like super cool if you started an initiative to do that. Um, but instead, I'm gonna show you an easy way to include more people on social media by adding alternative text for visually impaired users to your posts. It's super easy, but these settings aren't always common knowledge. Almost every social network hides them in unintuitive places. Once you know where they are, it's a snap. And to write good alternative text, in case you're not familiar, um, pretend that you're writing a tweet that would explain the photo to someone who can't see it. Not too long, but as much information as you can possibly convey quickly. Okay, so we'll start with Twitter. On Twitter, the setting to add alternative text to your post is actually opt-in. You have to turn the setting on. That's mm -hmm. really strange, but that is the case. Um, it's hidden in the settings page. You go to the accessibility tab, and then check the box that says compose image descriptions. Once you've checked that box, whenever you upload an image to Twitter, underneath you'll have a field that says alternative text, and you can punch alternative text in from there. Mm -hmm. So turn that on. Um, if you think you might forget sometimes, even I do, um, there is a Twitter you can subscribe to called Captions, Please. And if you subscribe to them, every time you post an image without captions, they will tweet back at you. <laughs> captions, please! <laughs> And then you can delete your tweet and try again with captions. On Facebook, you don't have to opt in. It's already on for you. You just need to know where the field is. So once you've uploaded a photo, hover over its preview in the post box, and over this little paintbrush, you'll see a thing that says edit photo. So click on that. Then it'll bring you to this screen. You click on alt text with the little magnifying glass, and that will give you a chance to put in alternative text. They do have some primitive AI, which is really cool that they're working on that, that will fill in the alternative text for you if you don't do this. It's primitive AI. It's, <laughs> it, it, it'll always be better if you do it yourself. Um, for instance, for this little mouse before I changed it, um, <laughs> the AI gave me man. Oh, no. Which, okay, I guess he's a little rat man. Um, but, but yeah, it, it needs love. So finally, if you're on the gram, as the cool kids are doing these days, upload your image and go through the first couple of paints. When you get to the screen that lets you write your own caption, click on advanced settings. Once you click on that, you'll see an option that reads write alt text. And then it'll give you a paint to write your alternative text. So that's how you can include everyone on your social media posts or at least people with visual disabilities. And thank you. Let's, make, let's work together to make the web awesome for everyone. And then I always kind of end short deliberately so that we have a chance for people to ask questions if need be. And if not, you can go potty and find your next session and stuff like that. But did we have any questions? Yeah, hi. You know, um, so with Instagram, you can share your post directly to Facebook. Mm -hmm. If you write all text on Instagram and share it to Facebook, does the all text come over? Okay, the question was, if you write all text on Instagram and then you share it over to Facebook, does that come over? And the answer is, I don't know. But that's a really good question. I never use that feature, so I've never checked. Um, but yeah, that'd be an interesting thing to check. Anybody else? We good? Well, all right. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you coming. <laughs>